What if you could store all of the world's data in the back of a car? My name's Alex Danis, I'm a genetics graduate student, and today we're gonna to talk about how you might be able to do just that using DNA. We live in a world that relies increasingly on digital data. Every picture you take, every Snapchat you send, every Instagram you post, every genome you sequence, everything creates more and more data, and we have to have some place to store all of that data. We've stored data in lots of different ways throughout human history, everything from scrolls and books to floppy disks and tapes and hard drives and cloud storage, and all of those different storage methods take up physical space, be that space on your desk next to your computer or often some server farm where you've bought space in the cloud. And as we create more and more data, it's gonna get harder to find spaces to store it, even as technology gets smaller and more compact. This is a two terabyte hard drive. It weighs about 1100 grams. On the other hand, this is just one gram of salt. It's gonna be our stand-in for DNA today because that's actually a lot of DNA. But this gram of DNA could potentially hold the same amount of information as 100,000 of these hard drives. That's crazy. Wild as this may sound, it actually makes some sense. DNA holds all of the data or instructions that make you, you. And it does all of this with just four little letters or bases, A, T, C, and G. So what if we could take computer files composed of binary zeros and ones and turn them into A's, T's, C's, and G's and store them in DNA rather than in something like this? Well, a few months ago, a couple of researchers at the New York Genome Center, Dr. Yaniv Ehrlich and Dina Zelensky, did just that. And Dina was kind enough to sit down and talk with me about their work. A project they called DNA Fountain. So can you start off just by telling me who you are and what you do? My name is Dina Zelinsky, and I'm a researcher in Yaniv Ehrlich's lab at the New York Genome Center. Uh, we're also affiliated with the Computer Science Department at Columbia University. What is the interest in storing data in DNA? So DNA has two huge advantages. One is that it's been around for a really long time, um, and it can last a really long time. It's pretty stable for hundreds, even thousands of years. Uh, you can recover meaningful information from DNA that's been found in cavemen, you know, 100,000 years ago or so. Um, it's also very dense. We can fit a lot of data into DNA. Um, and to give you an idea, because I know you mentioned talking about hard drives versus DNA, we can already store basically all the world's data in the back of a car if we were to use DNA. So what then were the first things that you guys decided to encode with DNA Fountain into DNA? Because it was sort of a cool group of things. Yeah, so that was the fun part. Um, Yaniv, my, my PI, um, asked, you know, what, what should we do? What should we put on the, um, on the DNA? Um, we're like, well, we should put some serious stuff like a manuscript. So we went with uh, the original manuscript by Claude Shannon, who kind of pioneered information theory. Um, I'm a Francophile, so I suggested the, one of the first ever motion pictures, which happened to be by the Lumiere brothers. Um, and for fun, an Amazon gift card, which has been spent. Uh, we also included a full operating system, mostly because the idea of encoding a whole operating system sounds pretty crazy. Um, but it's one of the smaller ones that I think used to fit on a floppy drive. Um, back in the day. <laughs> okay, so as a very much wet lab scientist, tell me how DNA Fountain works. Okay, so as a uh, traditionally wet lab scientist, I feel you. DNA Fountain um, is called DNA Fountain just because of the, the encoding scheme. Um, the only reason really is that we package the DNA in a certain way into what we call droplets. We can just basically randomly chop up our data of zeros and ones and package it into these droplets. We add some information um, about, the, um, about the way we encode it, just a few zeros and ones. Um, and by doing uh, this encoding scheme, we're able to then just translate these zeros and ones into A's, T's, C's, and G's. But that, that's kind of the first step, like when you just take a directory of files on your computer and zip it up. Uh, that's kind of what's going on. Once we have that file of A's, T's, C's, and G's, um, they're all the same length. They're all 200 bases long, so 200 A's, T's, C's, and G's. Uh, and then we just send this file, basically just a text file, to a DNA synthesis company. 
And then in about two weeks, we had a standard microtube and it contained lyophilized DNA. So this is just dried up DNA in the bottom of the tube. DNA is very stable. You can store it just in a cool, dark place. For example, a wine cellar would probably be okay. Uh, ideally, you know, in a freezer. Um, but what we're envisioning is, you know, a lot of people have asked, so will I be able to carry around my, my synthetic DNA with my family photos on it? And maybe, but right now we're kind of envisioning uh, DNA storage replacing server farms. So instead of big rooms of computer servers, you would have freezers with DNA. Now to get the information and data back out of the DNA, the scientists would have to sequence the DNA or read all of those A's, C's, T's, and G's, a process we talked about in a prior video. Then they could turn the DNA sequence back into zeros and ones. And this is a very standard procedure to sequence DNA. You just have to literally stick these ends on um, our, our oligonucleotides, and then they're ready for sequencing on what's called the Illumina platform. This is one of the, the biggest sequencing companies. And so uh, just to give you an idea of sort of the bottleneck in DNA storage, it took about two weeks and $7,000 to write the DNA. It took about two days and $2,000 to read the DNA. And so that over the last 10 plus years has been steadily going down um, and will continue to do so. But the real bottleneck is in the writing the DNA, the DNA synthesis. Now the team also did a couple of experiments to see how well their data would hold up over time. So thinking about plugging a hard drive in and out of a computer, you can do that as many times as you want and look at the data as many times as you want without degrading the amount of data that you have. But it's different with DNA. Every time you take a little bit of that DNA to look at it and get your data out, you're using up some of your DNA. So look at it too many times and you might be out of your DNA data. So the team tried using PCR, a technique to amplify DNA, to take a small quantity of their DNA, make many copies of it, and sequence from that instead. But then they took a sample of their amplified DNA and amplified that, and then amplified that, and amplified that, and on and on for nine serial amplifications. This is kind of like making many photocopies of a page and taking one of those and then making photocopies of it and then taking one of those and then making photocopies of it on and on. And it meant that they made exponential copies of their original DNA. They worried that after all of this copying, some of the original data might be lost. And after all of that amplifying, they could still perfectly recover 100% of their starting data. This means that looking at your data over and over won't actually be a problem at all. Awesome. They similarly diluted their sample over and over to see just how little DNA they needed to recover their message and therefore figure out the maximum storage capacity of a single gram of DNA. Their final maximum storage capacity was 215 petabytes per gram. A petabyte is a million gigabytes or a thousand terabytes or 500 of these drives. That means that their single gram of DNA at 215 petabytes per gram could store the equivalent of 107,500 of these drives. That's insane. So where do you see the future of DNA data storage? Do you really see that like when those costs come down, it's gonna be something that we're doing all the time to store things? Like, is that the hope? I think it might take at least another decade or so before this becomes really feasible. Uh, but if, if you have enough motivated people with enough, uh, enough funding, for a startup, for example, I know some are in the works. Um, I think it could happen sooner. Um, and I think, honestly, that initially people might not even know that their data is being stored in DNA, except that it's it'd be a pretty cool marketing s scheme to say, hey, we're gonna store your data in DNA. Um, but I think it, it could become routine. It's really incredible how much data you can store in DNA. So what is your, when you like, Think about this at the end of the day. What is your like craziest sci-fi potential of like what we could do with this in the far future? Like put everything that we know onto DNA and send it off on the next Voyager sort of thing. Like what's that like crazy cool idea? So we actually, that reminds me, we encoded the pioneer plaque. Yeah, so um, I think that would be very cool just to send all the world's data out there. Um, absolutely. Um, but. I think one of the most interesting questions we got from our Reddit AMA um, 
it was actually pretty easy to answer in the end was can we store data in my genome people wanted to imagine actually going in and editing your own genome so you can pass down your family history um, in your DNA and my thought is well you're kind of already doing that with ancestry right you've got your family history kind of built in um, but also it's it's not very safe to go in and edit your genome especially uh, at this point just to store data uh, most of our genome about half of it is highly repetitive and it turns out that even those regions have some functional effect so you don't want to go in and store pictures of grandma that might disrupt your your germline uh, especially when dna is really stable and safe in a cold dark place uh, so i think that was one of the more far-fetched applications uh, i think it could be possible i just personally don't see the the appeal <laughs> Maybe one day, this very video will be archived in DNA. Huge shout out to Dina for sitting down and talking with me about what I think is a super cool project. Also, a huge shout out to all of my supporters on Patreon who help make videos like this possible so that I can interview cool scientists because that is one of my absolute favorite things to do. Thank you so, so much. If you want to support, you can help out in the link down below. Or honestly, just share this video with someone who you think will find DNA data storage cool. Sharing is one of the most important things you can do, and I appreciate it so much when you like one of my videos enough to share it with somebody else. That's super cool to me. Go forth and do science.